This is Land of Havilah, Luke 17. Coming up, some brief comments that skip from subject to subject. Verse 1. He said to the disciples, It is impossible that no occasions of stumbling should come, but woe to him through whom they come. It would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea, rather than that he should cause one of these little ones to stumble. Comment, we shouldn't expose anyone to evil, especially children, Matthew 18, 5 and 6. In Genesis 3, Adam and Eve were innocent, but the serpent exposed them to evil, and they fell for it. Afterward, Adam and Eve were redeemed, but not the tempter. Quote, the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire, Revelation 3, 10. Woe to him who causes another to stumble. Verse 3, be careful. If your brother sins against you, rebuke him. If he repents, forgive him. If he sins against you seven times in the day and seven times return, saying, I repent, you shall forgive him. Comment. We're responsible to keep each other on the right track, and when someone repents, to forgive without limit. Verse 5. The apostles said to the Lord, Increase our faith. The Lord said, If you had faith like a grain of mustard seed, You'd tell the sycamore tree, be uprooted and be planted in the sea, and it would obey you. Comment, we all want great faith, but Jesus said we only need a little faith to work wonders. Instead of complaining that God didn't equip us with enough faith, we should exercise the faith we have. Verse 7, But who is there among you having a servant plowing or keeping sheep that will say when he comes in from the field, come immediately and sit down at the table? And will not rather tell him, Prepare my supper, clothe yourself properly, and serve me while I eat and drink. Afterward you shall eat and drink. Does he thank that servant because he did the things that were commanded? I think not. Even so, you also, when you have done all the things that are commanded you, say, We are unworthy servants. We have done our duty. Comment. Our reward is on the way, but it might not come for a long time, or even in this present age. Hebrews 11:13 We should serve patiently and not expect immediate gratification. Quote, Let's not be weary in doing good for we will reap in due season if we don't give up. Galatians 6:9 We serve him first, then surprisingly he serves us. Quote, Blessed are those servants whom the Lord will find watching when he comes. Most certainly I tell you that he will dress himself and make them recline, and will come and serve them. Luke 12, 37. And Hebrews 10, 36, quote, For you need endurance, so that, having done the will of God, you may receive your promise, end quote. Coming up, Jesus is still making his way to Jerusalem, ministering town by town. Verse 11. As he was on his way to Jerusalem, he was passing along the borders of Samaria and Galilee. As he entered into a certain village, ten men who were lepers met him who stood at a distance. They lifted up their voices, saying, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. When he saw them, he said to them, Go and show yourselves to the priests. As they went, they were cleansed. One of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back, glorifying God with a loud voice. He fell on his face at Jesus' feet, giving him thanks, and he was a Samaritan. Jesus answered, Weren't the ten cleansed, but where are the nine? Were there none found who returned to give glory to God except this stranger? Then he said to him, Get up and go your way. Your faith has healed you. Comment. Leprosy was a nightmare. According to Mosaic law and societal custom, lepers had to live apart from any populated area wear torn clothes, let their hair hang loose, and cry, unclean, unclean, Leviticus 13.45. They had no family or social life except with other lepers. Jesus told the ten lepers to show themselves to the priests, which was also Mosaic law, that if a leper experienced healing, he should be examined by a priest. If the priest confirmed that he was well, he had given permission to reenter society. So when Jesus sent the lepers to the priests, the implication was that they'd be healed on the way, and sure enough, in verse 14, as they went, they were cleansed. Jesus told them to go to the priest, but one of them made an executive decision to make a detour for thanks. 
He, quote, turned back glorifying God with a loud voice. He fell on his face at Jesus' feet, giving him thanks, end quote. The point was that there's a lot of ingratitude out there. The rate of ingratitude was 90%. So let's be in the 10% and make an executive decision to glorify God with a loud voice, going out of our way to give thanks. Coming up to round out the chapter, 18 verses of prophecy. Verse 20. Being asked by the Pharisees when God's kingdom would come, he answered them, God's kingdom doesn't come with observation. Neither will they say, look here or look there. For behold, God's kingdom is within you. Comment. The kingdom of God is a big subject. For one thing, is it now or later? The answer is yes and yes. It's both now and later. For now, the kingdom of God is within us not observable except to those who experience it. But as time goes by, verse 22, he said to the disciples, The days will come when you will desire to see one of the days of the Son of Man, and you will not see it. They will tell you, Look here or look there. Don't go away nor follow after them. For as the lightning, when it flashes out of the one part under the sky, shines to the other part under the sky, so will the Son of Man be in his day. But first, he must suffer many things and be rejected by this generation. Comment. Jesus will depart, and afterward many days will go by that people are expecting and desiring his return. When he does come, it will be sudden and obvious, like a bolt of lightning is sudden and obvious. Everyone's aware of the lightning as soon as it strikes. His return won't be secretive. Everyone will know it instantly. Now more about his return, verse 26. As it was in the days of Noah, even so will it be in the days of the Son of Man. They ate, they drank, they married, they were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ship, and the flood came and destroyed them all. Likewise, even as it was in the days of Lot, they ate, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they built. But in the day that Lot went out from Sodom, It rained fire and sulfur from the sky and destroyed them all. It will be the same way in the day that the Son of Man is revealed. Comment. God told Noah he had flood the earth. Noah preached it, 2 Peter 2, 5. But only his family listened. The flood didn't come for a long time, so long that no one expected it. It caught the vast majority off guard. God also destroyed Sodom suddenly. Quote, it will be the same way in the day that the Son of Man is revealed, end quote, meaning it will be the same as it was in the times of Noah and Sodom. After a long delay, there will be sudden destruction, and most will be caught off guard. More about the day of sudden destruction, the day that the Son of Man is revealed, verse 31. In that day, he who will be on the housetop and his goods in the house, let him not go down to take them away. Let him who is in the field likewise not turn back. Remember Lot's wife. Whoever seeks to save his life loses it, but whoever loses his life preserves it. I tell you, in that night there will be two people in one bed. The one will be taken and the other will be left. There will be two grinding grain together. One will be taken and the other will be left. They answering asked him, Where, Lord? He said to them, Where the body is, there will the vultures also be gathered together. Comment. There's room for honest speculation in end-time prophecy. Just as the prophecies of the first coming were difficult to unravel until they were fulfilled, so the prophecies of the second coming will be difficult to unravel until they're fulfilled. Quote, we know in part, 1 Corinthians 13, 9. Prophecies are riddles, Numbers 12, 8. As far as being on the housetop or in the field and fleeing and not turning back, not even going in the house for supplies, That refers to, quote, the days of the Son of Man, end quote, days plural, as it said in verse 26, the days that most people are eating, drinking, marrying, etc., and ignoring the fact that they'll answer to Christ. While everybody else is living confidently like tomorrow will always come, we should be living knowing that tomorrow won't always come. We might not have a minute to spare. We should escape the destruction of the world right now. If someone's on a housetop right now fiddling with his satellite dish, He shouldn't wait to come down to give his life to Christ. He should give it on the roof. We should flee the the destruction of this world like we could fall off that roof any second and die. 
or flee knowing that Christ could come back any second. We shouldn't pass go, collect $200, or go back in the house for supplies, open the refrigerator one more time. We should repent and commit our lives to Christ now. We can't live like there's no end. In verse 32, he said, Remember Lot's wife, which comes from Genesis 19.26. She looked back and became a pillar of salt. She didn't make escape from Sodom her priority. She set her mind on her past life rather than being single-minded about escape. We should be, quote, forgetting the things which are behind and stretching forward to the things which are before, Philippians 3.13. We should leave behind this world, which is so much like Sodom in its wickedness. Why should our affections be caught up in that? In verse 30, there'll be a day that the Son of Man will be revealed. Presumably, it'll be, as he already said, instantaneous like lightning flashing instantly from the east to west. So very interestingly, he specifically said it would be day in verse 31 concerning the man on the housetop and night in verse 34 concerning the two in bed, which confirms that Jesus knew about the round earth, that while it's day in one place, at the same instant it's night in another. At some point, Christ will return in the clouds. Is this the same day that he'll reveal himself to the world, or will he just come down to the clouds, collect the believers, and do a U-turn with them to the heavens and reveal himself to the rest of the world later? Believers in the graves will be caught up to meet the Lord in the air, and believers who are alive and remain will also be caught up, 1 Thessalonians 4.17. John says several times that this will be on the last day, as in, quote, This is the will of my Father who sent me, that of all he has given me, I should lose nothing, but should raise him up on the last day, John 6, 39. But what does last day mean? Is it the last day to participate in the rapture, or the last day before he returns to take the throne during a millennial era, or the last day before he destroys the heavens and the earth? Is it all the same day or separate days? But for the ones taken, the disciples asked in verse 37, where will they be taken? Jesus answered, where the body is, there will the vultures also be gathered together, which is cryptic. The Greek word for vulture also means eagle, so some English versions say vultures and some eagles, that the vultures or eagles will gather at the body or at the corpse, it's also translated. What could this indicate but that the bodies of believers will be gathered to the risen body of the Lord Jesus? but there are other interpretations. We should repent now and not be worried about the details of how it plays out. Whatever happens, we can be confident in the mercy and sufficiency of our Lord. Luke 18 is next at landofhavila.net. Luke 18.